We're uncomfortable with silence, aren't we? That was like three seconds right there, and you barely made it. We're uncomfortable with silence in our modern world. We've become so accustomed to the noise that is elevated uh, in our lives that we're not really sure. We haven't really counted the cost of what that noise is doing to us. In 2013, there was a study that they did on mice. And it was a really interesting, fascinating study that I read about that where they were going to expose different mice to different levels of noise, and they kept a control group uh, that experienced two hours of silence during the, uh, the experiment. And what they found totally shocked them. They found what they weren't looking for. And while they were looking for changes in the mice that maybe had received lots of sound levels, what they weren't expecting was that in the mice that experienced the two hours of silence, they saw a lot of brain cell growth in areas of learning and memory. Last week, the Wall Street Journal published an article with similar uh, information saying long-term exposure to aircraft and road traffic noise increases the risk of developing hypertension and cardiovascular disease, according to a 2008 study of those who had lived near kind of the five uh, major uh, six major air, European airports. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and furthermore, right, uh, in France, there's a nonprofit uh, that reported that the clangor of roads, trains, um, and planes reduced the lifespan of some residents of the Paris region by three years. Studies also suggest that periods of silence could encourage the uh, development of brain cells and that two minute pauses and passages of music could actually decrease blood pressure and induce a relaxed state. Um, maybe we should rethink the noise just a little bit, right? The, the word noise itself, we think about it in, in terms of sound, right? It's something that you hear. It's an acoustic thing that impacts you. But the word for noise can also be used in other contexts as well. It can be used in the context of photography or technology, right? And it really stands for any sort of static or interference that impedes what you're doing. Today's passage is a really fascinating one from Ecclesiastes 4, 4 through 16. In today's passage, it is not immediately apparent how all of the pieces and verses fit together, but there is a common theme of noise and static and interference throughout them all. Three, there are three chunks in today's passage uh, in which Solomon is going to explore three different types of noise and how it interferes with us living life to the full, which is what Jesus has in store for us. If you haven't heard much about Christianity or who Jesus is, that's what God wants is for us to live life to the full as he created us to live it and to live it abundantly. Uh, and yet the static and the noise level of society often interferes with and gets us off track with embracing that walk and that life. And so as we dig in today, we're going to look into these three chunks. If you have your Bibles or your Bible on your phone, I encourage you to go to Ecclesiastes 4, starting at verse 4. And we're going to dig in. And we're going to hear Solomon calling out to us, and really God through Solomon calling out to us, saying, Are you wise? Do you want to be wise? Then listen in. All right, and so here's this first chunk here from Ecclesiastes 4, 4 through 6, and it's worth noting that in this first chunk, um, what's happening here is what happens with a lot of wisdom literature and psalms and poetry of the Old Testament is there's a couplet going on. So the first verse is going to be answered by the second verse or complemented by the second verse, and then uh, the third one, verse 6, is going to summarize for us. So let's dig in. Uh, then I saw all... I saw that all toil and all skill in work come from a man's envy of his neighbor. This also is vanity and a striving after the wind. The fool folds his hands and eats his own flesh. Better is a handful of quietness than two hands full of toil and a striving after the wind. So Solomon really wants to dig into this idea here of the noise of discontentment. This idea that often in life, uh, sin and Satan and the sinful desires around us, they are working on us to, to get us to compare ourselves to other, uh, other people. 
to get us to be envious of what others have and what we desire to have. Maybe we don't have it and we think it's owed to us or we really want it, right? It can be the perfect house. It can be possessions. It can be a a nice car. It can be the schedule that's flexible enough to get out in the mountains, right? Uh, It can be food. It can be status. It can be some sort of promotion at work or whatever it is, right? But there's often things that we are envious of of others. And that doing, that comparison, uh, is what sin and Satan desire for us to do. And so often it gets us to toil after getting the, the wealth or, or the status needed to have those things, right? And when we talk about toil in the passage, um, there's good toil and bad toil. There's healthy toil, healthy work, Uh, which usually involves using your gifts to bless others. Uh, No matter what you do for a living, I want you to know and to carry it into this next week that when you do that thing, it's to serve others, right? It doesn't matter what you sell, what service you provide. That's a primary way that God uses you to bless others. And in that work, it may be difficult. It may be an easy day. It may be a really rough day. But at the end of it, you can go, I served others. There was a a good outcome, and I feel good for the labor that I put in. Uh, Hopefully, you know, the feelings don't always always follow if it's a really hard day. But hopefully, when you get done with healthy work, most of the time, maybe it's kind of like working out in the garden uh, or, or doing some physical activity where there was a bit of exertion, but you're like, that felt good, right? Not always the case, but hopefully. Toil, on the other hand, with the wrong motivations, with an envious motivation, uh, is a desire to get uh, for oneself without really much of a concern for what you're providing to others. Uh, it is a, an exhausting of oneself past the boundaries of physical and emotionally and spiritual health. It is not offset by, by times of rest because it is a chase after something elusive. But as the passage says, it is a grasping after the wind. You are not going to be able to grab it because uh, typically when we are envious, uh, when we're just trying to get that thing, our eyes just go gr- bigger and bigger the closer to it we get. And we set the goal further and further out, and we don't ever grab on to fulfillment as long as we're chasing the next best thing. That's the noise of discontentment. And it carries consequences. Who here has ever used active noise-canceling headphones? So not just headphones that block out like with, with the physical, but who, the headphones where you, it actually cancels out the noise electronically. All right. Maybe you've tried these on, maybe you have a pair in your pocket, right? But active noise-canceling headphones are really interesting and fascinating because they don't stop the noise from coming in. In fact, the noise still kind of comes through. But what they do is they generate an equal but sort of opposite sound wave in order to cancel out the noise that's getting uh, to your ear. And so the, the end effect is that that sound is eliminated or reduced But we have to remember, sound is not just something that you hear. It is atmospheric pressure waves, right? And so active noise-canceling headphones, they may cut out the sound so you can't hear it, but the pressure wave is still impacting your ears. I don't know about y'all, but after a couple hours of using them, I have to give it a break because my ears are sore. I can't quite describe the feeling, but there's a feeling like something has still been, my ears have been subjected to something, even if I couldn't quite perceive what it was. And that's the way it is with envy and comparison. We may not see the harm in going after this or that, but it carries with it a cost. It's not always just about money either. We always think about greed, but envy is a little more broad, right? Think about the examples that we have in Scripture. Many examples, in fact, that have nothing to do with money. I mean, some of them do, but think about like with with Joseph uh, and his brothers. Um, His brothers are envious of him, not primarily because he had the cool rainbow coat, uh, but because he had status in his father's eyes. He was his father's favorite child, right? Kind of a dysfunctional family relationship. Uh, so, So come on, dad and mom. But they were jealous of that relationship. And so that's why they sought to first kill him and then sell him into slavery, right? Uh, Rachel and Leah. I should say this off the top. There is no example of a happy polygamous marriage in Scripture. (laughs) Um, It just does not work, okay? There's not an example of like, wow, that really worked well and was a great decision. It's like, no. Um, But the, the reality is Rachel could not have children and Leah could. 
And Rachel was insanely jealous of that, right? But that, that's, that was a deep hurt and something that she desired. And some of us can sympathize with that, right? Uh, and because of that, there was animosity in the relationship. Or think about King Saul and David. Saul was the king. He had everything. He had all the power and the wealth. He could do whatever he wanted to. And yet he was jealous of this young soldier, David, because the people's heart was with him. The people chanted out his victories and they loved him as their champion. And Saul could have embraced that, but instead he was jealous uh, and he desired for people to be calling out his name as well. He wanted the status that David had with others um, in the eyes of the world, right? And it makes us just think about ourselves of what envious thoughts have we had over this past week? Think back, who were we jealous of for their status or possessions or power or for sort of the non-monetary stuff of things were just going right in their life and we wanted it to go right for us too, right? Uh, Who have we been envious of? There is nothing new under the sun, and God anticipated our envious spirits long ago. In fact, in the Ten Commandments in the book of Exodus, um, he, he gives us in the Ninth and Ten Commandments this idea of you shall not covet, not your neighbor's house, uh, or you should not covet your neighbor's wife or male servant, female servant, ox, donkey, anything that is your neighbor's, right? We could go on. Uh, don't covet your neighbor's stuff. Don't covet your neighbor's status in life. Um, Scripture also reminds us of that imperceptible cost of envy. Um, If you check this out in Proverbs, it says, A tranquil heart gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. There's something that happens inside of us that hurts us when envy and comparison is a part of our journey, and we're all prone to it. And yet Solomon points out here, well, this is something for us to work on, right? This is a big part of generating discontentment in our life, and the noise of dis- discontentment rises as comparison rises. And lastly, in Psalms, if you've memorized Psalm 23, you, you remember the first line, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. There's a reason why it starts off first and foremost with who God is uh, because, you know, God and who he is by nature because he's loving and just and he cares for us who created us in his image. That's first and foremost the primary comfort. And then the second part is the primary warning of be careful of what you want and what that does to us. We're going to come back to this. Uh, But as we go through the rest of of this first chunk of Ecclesiastes, uh, we find then the compliment in verse 5, right? The fool folds his hands, and we could translate this as wastes away, right? Or starves to death. Uh, That somewhere here, like, we're, we're not to envy, but we're also not to live in apathy either, right? Don't toil for the wrong reasons. Don't sit back and not toil for any reason. Uh, but instead, verse 6 strikes the point in the balance. Better is a handful of quietness than two hands full of toil and a striving after the wind. Quietness is something we can actually grasp through Jesus. And we're going to get back to that in just a second. But I want to get into this second chunk of Ecclesiastes first, all right? In this second chunk, We're going to see him get sort of switch gears a little bit, right? He says, again, I saw vanity under the sun. One person who has no other, no companion, uh, either son or brother, yet there is no end to all his toil, and his eyes are never satisfied with riches, so that he never asks, for whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? This also is vanity and an unhappy business. Two are better than one because they have good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they will keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? And then lastly, and though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. And so we're here, Solomon switched gears, and he wants to talk about uh, the interference of disconnection in our lives. That first and foremost, spiritual forces of evil, they want us unhappy. They want us discontent. And then they want us disconnected from one another. And this is the way that the world has evolved, right? Uh, That because of the high pace 
of life. Some of us are feeling that busyness of life because of our ability to move and live wherever we want to and and sort of live in places where we don't have deep-rooted family um, ties because of modern architecture and our houses are constructed so that the backyard is the hangout place, the front yard, uh, you don't really hang out there. Uh, Because of social media, because of media consumption at home, because of grocery pickup and mobile orders, right? The world has become a place in which we are increasingly isolated. As it makes life easier, it also takes us away from face-to-face interaction with others. It's made it harder for, to date. Uh, the single folks in here like know the struggle uh, can be real. Uh, it has made it harder to, to seek and to have solid, amazing friendships. I think, you know, particularly as a man, I think how hard it is to have uh, just to connect with other men and to create strong relationships there, right? Um, society has left us sometimes so deprived of relationships and so robbed in spirit that we often, for us, even make choices uh, to be alone. That we often, instead of it just being something that the world does to us, uh, sometimes it's a choice that we actively make because we're, we're so used to what the world has done that it's easier to just go, you know what, I'll just do my own thing. Then I don't, I don't have to play nice with others. I don't have to talk about deep stuff. I don't have to open up emotionally. One extreme example of that is, is the face mask, of course. And, and I don't even want to talk about the last 18 months. Like, it's too soon, okay? Hashtag too soon. Uh, but um, even before this pandemic, even before March 2020, many people in Asian countries were wearing masks uh, for different things that were going around in those countries and whatnot. But a, a crazy example of how we self-isolate is that in Japan, they did studies and, and found that 30% of mask wearers were wearing them for non-medical reasons. That they, they were wearing them to combat social anxiety. They were wearing masks to give other people a cue that they did not want to interact or talk. Uh, they were even wearing them to cover up, you know, not having makeup on. <laughs> they, were, they were afraid of getting in social engagements without makeup on. Uh, and that sometimes we do, it sounds silly, but sometimes we do the same in our avoidance of connection and real and lasting connection is when presented with opportunities, we don't quite lean in. But as the passage ended with in verse 12, uh, two are better than one and three even better than that, right? We're going to come back to this too. Last chunk, Ecclesiastes uh, 4, starting at, at 13. And here, again, he switches gears. And I'm going to be honest, this last chunk is a little hard to comprehend. It's kind of a multiple read-through type of thing. In the ESV translation, I was like, what is happening even in this? So anyway, I'm going to give you the God's Word translation. It's a little bit easier uh, to break down what's happening here. Uh, But the first verse, when you look at it, like in a paper Bible, it's split off on its own, uh, and so it's contrasted with what follows, right? But it says, a young man who is poor and wise is better than an old foolish king who won't take advice any longer. That's sort of the proverb, and then we're going to answer that. A young man who came out of prison to rule as king, even though he had been born in poverty in that same kingdom. I saw all living people moving about under the sun, and they sided with the second young man, the king's successor. There was no end to all those people, everyone whom he led, but those who will come later will not be happy with the successor. Even this is pointless. It's like trying to catch the wind. I mean, could you guys imagine a political system that will toss out one leader and and then go with the next and then flip back on them? That'd be terrible, right? We're fickle people to be led, are we not? Um, But in this passage, it's really getting at this idea of the noise of disillusion, right? Uh, The meaning is a little bit obscure, but uh, and disillusion is the wrong word, uh, but delusion is the word I was searching for there. That in this passage, while we, we can't entirely grasp maybe what Solomon, his entire meaning was, what we can grasp is that we often believe that certain people of authority and power, certain celebrities, certain politicians, certain influencers, that they're living sort of the ideal life. They're living the life with the most resources, with the most enjoyment, with the the loudest parties and all this great stuff, and we envy them to come back to the envy concept. But we can see Solomon pointing out to us here, right, that the grass is not always greener on the other side, right? We're not to envy those because often power gives a false sense 
of control over our destiny. That the, the more power uh, and more resources we have, sometimes is the, the more problems and the farther we, away we get from actually appreciating others and our need for them and from appreciating God and that actually he is sovereign over our lives. The more we can make it on our own, the more he tends to decrease in our estimation, right? But to come back to the first part of this chunk, verse 13, this sort of proverbial statement, a young man who's poor and wise is better than an old foolish king who won't take advice any longer. Jesus is actually the one who has the wisdom of God. When you think about Ecclesiastes, we can think about a book of contradictions. Life is unfair, but be fair, right? Wisdom is vanity, but be wise. Life has no order, but order your life. Um, you know, life has no value, but value it. Uh, and so it's a book of contradictions. It's a book where Solomon speaks for society on one hand, but then he also speaks to God, to the people on the other hand. And he tells us, right, that wisdom in faith is to be sought. And Jesus is the full embodiment of the wisdom and power of our God. Jesus comes uh, in order that we might be freed from thinking we have to have and plug that God-given hole through other means, but instead Jesus comes that we might be freed from the power of greed and of envy and of searching for fulfillment in created things, and that we might find it instead in our Creator uh, and in his son whom he has sent, right? Jesus is the one that comes and he goes to the cross so that we might be freed from the power of sin, death, and the grave and the discontent, disconnection, and delusion that it gives us. Jesus comes to bind us back together with the Father. He is the one who's come to reunite us with God, like we're all prodigals, and he's like, come on back into this right relationship with the one who made you and loves you because you reflect his image, right? Uh, and so Jesus is that cord that binds. We talk about the cord that binds often in the, the marriage um, context, but Jesus is the one who first binds him to himself and then enables us to have meaningful relationships with others. He opens the door for that to happen. And the church, which is not this building or the, the beautiful, you know, stained glass at the back. But the church, which is all of us, is God's sort of cord of little spider webs. He desires uh, not just a cord of a couple strands, but tons of strands going every which way as we relate with one another, care for one another, raise one another up, and encourage one another as the body of Christ. I remember there was a mission trip that I went on. And uh, during this mission trip, they did this activity near the end where one person had a, a ball of yarn and they hung on to the end of it and then they threw it across the circle to someone with whom they'd grow, grown closer to over the trip. And you were supposed to just kind of share uh, something meaningful about how you'd grown, grown closer to them. And then you kept hanging on to your part of the rope and, and they would keep throwing it back and forth and pretty soon there's sort of a web that's been made and it's overlapping. And it's a beautiful thing. And then it came to me and I had to decide who I was going to throw it to and I'll let you in on a little thing. I threw it to the wrong person, all right? Uh, you know, it wasn't lack of aim. I was a quarterback in high school, so I can make that shot. But um, what it was, was I threw it to the person that I was trying to score points with, frankly. I was a band kid. I wasn't a cool kid. You guys know this. Uh, and so, you know, there was always this guy I was trying to get in kind of closer with, one of the popular kids, and I kind of tossed it to him. Um, and in hindsight, I should have recognized what the Spirit was leading me to do was throw it to another guy, a guy who had actually had, had more conversation with throughout the trip, had grown closer with someone who was maybe not in the, the inner circle or whatever else. Uh, but I should have, instead of throwing it to someone for my own benefit, thrown it to the one that God was calling me to throw it to for our mutual benefit uh, and to include him in what the body of Christ was up to. That's what God wants for us to do, is because of our relationship with him, to also be able to relate meaningfully with others uh, and to toss them the yarn, so to speak, right? And Jesus modeled this in his ministry, and he modeled it through a quiet life and ministry. We've been hinting at in Ecclesiastes here, uh, this idea of a handful of quietness and contentment, and, and, and this idea of the power of pause, of putting the noise of the world on pause 
in order to embrace a bit of thinking and pondering space. There's this great quote that says that all profound things and emotions of things are preceded and attended by silence. That making room, just like with the mice, how they grew through that silence, that so we too, we need time for quietness in our spiritual journey in order to be healthy people who are going about our lives. In fact, if we look at St. Benedict's Ladder of Humility, I saw this on social media this week and I thought that was really cool. And this is sort of his ladder of how to increase in your journey of following Jesus, your humility. And I noticed here that radical honesty about your weaknesses comes two steps before embracing and and being transformed by silence and and quiet. And so we too, when we realize that, that we don't really know how, it's time to be open and real with one another and with God about that, right? God, we don't know how to be entirely content in a, a quiet life. We don't know how to entirely slow down, right? And oftentimes, we don't know how to experience God not on the mountaintop, right? We're looking for his voice and where it's louder than society, right? And where his voice may rise above temporarily and we're like, yeah, there God is, right? So much so, though, that we've forgetten, forgotten how to find him in the whisper in the moments of devotion and prayer and in quietness. And we pray, God, teach us to embrace the, the quiet life. And, and, but what does that mean? What does it mean to lead, lead a quiet life? We see that in Scripture. We hear that on occasion. Certainly, it's not just about noise. You can't just buy a pair of headphones for this. What is the quiet life? As you think about what it is for you, Some thoughts that have been going through my head this week as I meditate on this passage have been, the quiet life is a life where we work on our character more than our achievements. It is a life in which we, uh, in our vocations, are people of integrity, where we're not self-promoting. We're grateful for what we have, not envious of what we don't have. We're not swayed by every fad that comes across. We're comfortable in our own skin and with who God has created us to be. We do good deeds that often go unnoticed, and we don't need to be loud in order to be heard. Those are some of the things I've thought of when I've thought of what is the quiet, simple life look like, right? We don't, we don't have to always be making a racket in order to lead lives of significance. And to grab a handful of quietness, which is what the passage encourages us to do today, to grab a handful of quietness in order to combat that discontent and that disconnection and that delusional thinking is to do a few things. First and foremost, it's to be grateful. Gratitude uh, is that pathway for wanting, not only wanting less, but being happier. Right? When we spend time uh, in God's word to listen and not always to speak, uh, when we in prayer are able to, with God, be open and real and honest and to say thank you for these many blessings in my life, many of which often go unnoticed, right? The blessings of food on the table and shelter and clothes and meaningful work and the relationships on our lives and basically all these things that we take for granted that gratitude in scripture reading and in prayer is a way that we say thank you to God for those things and our heart is trained to be happy and content with what we have, right? Um, what others may have is not our concern. That God gives to each. He's, he's doing a different thing in each and every one of our lives. And instead of us going, well, I didn't get that thing or whatever else, right? That's not fair uh, to go, God has blessed me well beyond what I have earned and deserve. He's doing that with others as well. And he's taken them on a journey too. And so I pray that they may prove faithful with, with, with what God has given them, just as I want the same for me. Grabbing a handful of quietness is also making relational choices. To intentionally make choices where we embrace community and reject those things that circumvent community. And so maybe for some of those technologies and modern luxuries that take us out of contact with people, maybe we avoid using them sometimes, right? Avoid the mobile order, avoid the Grubhub, you know, whatever it is, right? And so that we actually get face-to-face with people. Maybe it's avoiding always doing things through, through text and email and, and social media and picking up the phone or walking down to an office, right? Um, maybe, you know, it's, it's things like embracing rhythms that bring us into contact with others, like being front yard people, you know, fighting the trend and actually hanging out on the front porch or wherever, and that we might encounter people along the way. 
It could be things like embracing silence in conversational space. How many of us say funny things or, or try and do something to move along from conversational silence and letting, instead of letting that silence just be? Because we're uncomfortable with it. We ruin the moment sometimes. But silence is going to be an important tool just for allowing us to think and to communicate with one another, to talk. Um, it allows us to ponder. It allows us to sit with heavier things. And instead of just tossing words out to fill the gap, to go deeper. Making relational choices is also making a choice like a choice for life group. Life groups are small communities that follow Jesus on mission together in our St. John's and Renewal community. Uh, they are like close, they become like close family to a lot of people. And it's a, a choice and it's a, it's a recognition that on Sunday morning we can rub elbows with people and share a coffee, but to go deeper with people. Uh, and to enter into relationship with people with whom we can live life and, and have fun and support one another uh, through tough times and, and all of those things, right? And that life group is something that we believe is incredibly healthy. And a handful of quietness is renewing the mind, especially renewing it against the delusion that we sometimes buy into, right? That it's greener on the other side and with more. Um, the chief delusion is that the quiet life is a boring life. When in reality, the quiet life that Jesus is after uh, is, is not a boring life, but instead a life of receiving more than we ever thought that we could receive and having more abundant joy than we can have with the noise of the world causing static around us. Loud seems great, but it can be distracting. How many of y'all, um, with your dad or mom, did they ever have to turn down the radio to see better when they're in the car? Anyone? Maybe you're that person now, right? And you're like, how does that help you to see better? Like, it doesn't make any sense, right? The brain can only handle so much. And there's a reality that the distraction that it causes, even though it doesn't impair your sight, uh, can sometimes impede what you're doing, what we're doing, right? And as we think about rebooting, as we enter out of the pandemic, we don't want new normal, we want renewed normal. And as we reboot, we don't want to go back to the noise level of before and just filling the void with noise. But what would it look like for us to turn things down a bit? And what do we need to turn up in quietness in its place? It is July in Colorado, which uh, means one thing. I have to stay out of the sun or I'm going to get burnt to a crisp. Um, but no, Colorado gets really toasty, right? Especially in July. Um, you know, you stay in the shade, you're good. But you step out into the, the cosmic death ray known as the sun and like prepare to melt, um, depending on the day, right? Um, it's, it's a time when we all appreciate having our, our uh, AC, our evaporative coolers. And, and I was thinking about when I came to Colorado, I had never seen a swamp cooler before. And they were like, there was one in our rental home instead of AC. And they're like, it's just as good as air conditioning. It's not just as good as air conditioning, right? That was a lie. Um, and, and when the temperature is 98 or 100, it may take the edge off, uh, but that doesn't get us all the way to where we want to be, right? What's interesting about, about these is especially with a swamp cooler, which there's, it's not a circulating system, but it's bringing air into the house, um, is it's a both and. You, in order to get the heat out, you also have to push in cool air. And counterintuitively, the, the way to allow that process to happen is to open a window, which I'm like, I want to keep the heat out there, right? That's what I'm trying to do. Uh, I don't need the scorching stuff in here. Why open a window? But you have to give it a moment you give it a, a way for the flow to start happening, right? And it's not just our desire for community. It's not our desire for contentment. It's not our desire uh, to be people of truth, which gets us anything. But it's the action of opening the window for Jesus that gets the transformation process, which he has begun in us, and gets it moving. And through that process, to embrace the quiet life, to embrace... Uh, what may come in the void of the noise, a life of contentment and a community and truth from following Jesus, from listening into him and listening hard and going, Lord, speak. Your servant is listening. May we ponder and embrace the quiet life this next week 
and see what the Lord will do as we make room for him in our hearts. We pray. God, we thank you for this time that we get to spend together this morning. That we can prioritize this time to get together, to celebrate the body of Christ, and to gather together around your gifts, your word, and your sacraments. God, we thank you that you are a God who enters in, who becomes poor for our sake in order that we might be redeemed and reconciled to you. We thank you for that which you have done and the many blessings that you give us throughout daily life, which we often take for granted. We pray also that you would give us the courage to embrace your gospel message through being willing to push out those things this week, which ultimately are creating static in our lives and to be open to that which you will bring in their stead. Help us to embrace the quiet life, Lord, that we might be people after your own heart. God, we thank you uh, that this is a place where we can be real and open with one another. We can celebrate that this is a diverse body of people who might not have been united except for any other reason, except for you and your sacrifice on the cross. And may we seek to continue to throw that ball of yarn and to continue to develop relationships with people that we don't know in this community, that it may be stronger, healthier, as we follow Jesus on mission together.